Yeah, hi Vinas. Uh, I'll just try to continue the yesterday's part of biochemistry that we are discussing the structure of RNA and DNA, the synthesis of proteins and everything. I'll try my best to continue that particular part and I uh, want your response in the chat box that if everything is fine and ready, I'll just proceed. We'll wait for uh, <coughs> two to three minutes and then we'll take a move. We'll wait for the crowd to join and once we get the clearance, then we'll start the proceedings. Uh, yesterday the strength was around like, uh, I think it's around like 140 or 150. So I hope some decent crowd today. Uh, I, I hope the voice and everything is clear today when compared with yesterday because we have added one more device uh, or one more tool to the list so that the clarity I think the clarity is better when compared with the last two days uh, I want your response uh, with a thumbs up sign or with a word done uh, in the chat box so that I'll proceed further into the discussion. I'll make this discussion as simple as possible, uh, basically focusing on problem solving areas of this uh, uh, part and apart from that I'm going to discuss few other small small miscellaneous topics straight away from the textbook. So previously they have asked questions from these areas. I'm just going to cover those questions. Apart from that I'm going to cover in and around the particular topic. So before taking the session, okay, uh, there are few things that uh, I need to exchange with you. The first important thing is about your approach towards the subject. Previously, whether you are an intern or whether you are a repeater or whether you are a housewife preparing for entrance or a clinician keeping half of your time on practice and half of your time on preparation or any other sector because we have so many sector people in the online session as well as in the offline because I can see few uh, mothers in the offline session few clinicians recently there are four or five clinicians who has taken a move uh, to restart the preparation taking all these people into consideration uh, what I can exchange is whether you are any of these category <clears throat> an intern from a college with a good OP or a bad OP whatever it may be once you are back to college okay the dates were not fixed tentatively let it be 14th or let it be 15th once you are back to the college or once you are back to the clinic as a clinician to your clinic or whether you are working as a clinic from 15th april how the scenarios will be is definitely there will be a drop in your work more than 50 percent okay because the OP may slightly drop, slightly, the slightness, the slightliness can be up to 50% or 60% in few cases it can hit 100% because people are scared of COVID-19, they are scared. So until the things become normal, it may take 6 months or it may take 1 year for the things to become normal, by the end of 1 year your NEET exam will be done. By the end of one year, your NEET exam will be finished. Your NEET exam is going to complete. Okay, so make a note that what you are going to show the difference. How you are different. Like interns, they may have a plan like, okay, I have to work on more patients, learn some work. Clinicians, I want to work on more patients, make some money. Okay, different people have different tasks. These tasks are not up to the mark. For sure, they will not be up to the mark. So you need to find a better way to show an improvement in yourself because as a patient's point of view you have to go two steps behind so you need to find another way where you can make yourself better either by reading books or either by changing your approach towards the crowd 
or either by coming with some innovation that may help dentistry or that may help you in turn or a repeater or any other people any other category of people who are a part of this please think over this so this is a very very important note that you have to make a note to make yourself better so that is uh, one i feel to discuss and uh, we'll straight away get into the discussion part okay uh, a, a a message in the chat box so that i'll check over so that i can i can make some modifications so that the session should be as comfortable as possible for you okay so just a sec we'll wait two more we'll wait for two more minutes so that we will proceed yeah <clears throat> let's start <clears throat> so yesterday we were discussing uh, the base pairs in rna and dna so coming to the base pairs i'm just going to recap it so there are three three base pairs which are common for rna and dna they are adenine guanine and cytosine they are common for both rna and dna <clears throat> the only difference is okay in the case of rna you will have uracil whereas in the case of dna you will have thiamine so that is the only thing which is an exchange next one next one the important thing is is the rule okay yesterday i was discussing about this rule as dna is a double helical structure okay so any double helical structure okay is going to follow this particular rule okay a single strand cannot follow this rule it is a rule that is followed by the double helical structure what this chargaff's rule says is the number of purines on one side or on one strand are equal to the number of pyrimidines on other strand so because the a is going to form a bond between t okay adenine is going to form a bond between thiamine and the number of hydrogen bonds are 2 whereas the guanine is going to form between the cytosine and the number of bonds are 3 in which you can compare the number of purines on one strand are equal to the number of pyrimidines on other strand for example the amount of adenine is equal to the number of thiamine and the number of guanines are equal to the number of cytosine 
so this is how the structure that is that to the double helical structure of dna is maintained so taking this formula into consideration you can solve few mcqs which were the toughest mcqs among the list of dna and rna in the biochemistry part for example <clears throat> so what they are going to give is they are going to give the base pairs on the main strand and they may ask you the what are the base pairs on the complementary strand we are we are always discussing that your dna double helical structure is you'll have a complementary one moves from five to three direction other moves from three to five direction in anti parallel so they are going to give one main standard they are going to ask you the remaining things for example in this particular question they have clearly given that the main stand is a t g a t t g a c a t t g a g g a t c c a t so they are going to ask what is the complementary for this so with your chargaff rules you can find the complementary for this how so see the complementary i already discussed that a is going to form a bond hydrogen bond with t on other strand and t is going to form a bond with a on other strand c is going to form with c on other strand a t t a t a c g a t c g and a t similarly so they can give you the main strand and they can ask you in the options to pick up the complementary strand so this is a first level means they are going to give a single strand of dna and they are going to ask you the complementary strand so you got a double standard dna now this is all this is a structure of a double standard dna according to the watson and the click so next what they can ask so next level what they can ask is this is for example this is a one more question where this is a main strand main strand runs from 5 dash to 3 dash that is t t a a g c t a c whereas the complementary strand as already discussed in the rules of watson and click it runs in the opposite direction anti parallel so it runs from 3 dash to 5 dash and you can have all the complementaries a as t has a as complementary so a a has t as complementary t t c has g g has c has g and g has c so this is how the complementary is generated so what the complementary is going to give rise to the complementary in the next level is going to give rise to the mrna so we have learned the central dogma of the life that is what our dna is going to convert into rna rna is going to convert it into protein right so now this is a double standard dna which is now converted into an rna that is mrna sequence so what is the difference between a normal dna to mrna sequence for example if you see the structural difference between the dna and rna is uracil and thiamine see here you the a's are same a's are will be the same wherever you have t wherever you have t because the rna is having uracil it's not having thiamine so the thiamines will be replaced by uracil so a a u u c g will be the same a will be the same again the t is replaced by u and g is same okay okay so you got mrna so the first level of central dogma of life is done that dna is going to synthesis rna so the, what is the second half of central dogma of life that rna is going to synthesis proteins okay so you got your main strand you got your complementary strand and the next level is you got your mrna right your mrna is going to synthesis proteins all your mrnas three base pairs together represents one ammonia acid so these are all ammonia acids so finally your the sequence of ammonia the sequence of base pairs is going to convert into ammonia acids so these are these five are ammonia acids for this particular sequence so similarly they can ask n number of questions they can ask you they can give you the main stand like this they can give you the main stand they can ask you the complementary stand okay or they can ask you the mrna sequence of that particular main stand or they can ask you the protein sequence they can ask you the ammonia acid sequence of that particular mrna so these are the different levels where they can ask question one is main stand second one is complementary stand the next one from the double stranded dna you will get mrna from mrna you will get the 
ammonia acid sequence from ammonia acid a sequence of ammonia acid a group of ammonia acid gives rise to the structure of protein so we have already discussed that a and t bonds together with hydrogen bonds that is two hydrogen bonds where c and g bond together with three hydrogen bonds and they can simply ask a question like giving a stand a stand of dna and they can ask you how many hydrogen bonds are to be broken or how much of energy is required to break this double stranded dna into single strand for example this is this is a main, i think it is a main strand for example if this is a main strand you, you have to write the complementary for this so how the complementary are fixed together in a double stranded dna is by the hydrogen bond so they can ask you how much of energy is required to break these hydrogen bonds by just counting the number of a's or g's or t's or c's you will get the number of hydrogen bond for example t is bonded to a by two hydrogen bonds a is bonded to t by two hydrogen bonds c to g is 3 g to c is 3 a 2 a 2 t 2 c will have 3 a will have 2 g will have 3 C will have three, T will have two, G will have three, and T will have two, A two. So totally, you have to count the number of hydrogen bonds, and this is a number of hydrogen bonds to be broken to convert that double stranded DNA into single stranded DNA. I hope you are clear with uh, this mode of breaking of bonds. Or they can simply give N. Okay, N is the kilojoules or the joules of energy that is required for breaking of one hydrogen bonds. Then how much because they can give you how much of energy is used for breaking a single hydrogen bond and they can ask you to calculate n number into the energy required to break one bond is equal to the total number of energy that is really required to break that particular hydrogen bond okay so these are the areas where uh, they'll ask you the multiple questions and uh, guys i need a proper response from your side uh, in the chat box so that i'll proceed for further if everything is clear please do drop me done so that i'll proceed further to few more other mysterious topics which are very very important in examination point of view there are, there are two or three topics i kept uh, once we are done with this uh, mostly uh, these are the areas where the questions are already given we have questions already i'm just going to explain few things in and around that particular topic so that you will be strong in that particular topic uh yes we have 150 strength it's very good and uh, yeah done done yeah i'm proceeding further so next is ketone bodies are already partially discussed on your group and i have posted a good pdf uh, which is more than sufficient to crack most of your questions but this is a textbook area where you have to focus on uh, to get a better command okay so coming to the things compounds namely acetone acetoacetate beta hydroxy butyrate which is also called as 3 hydroxy butyrate are known as ketone bodies or acetone bodies so these are the three ketone bodies they can ask you which of the following is a ketone body pick them all of the following are ketone bodies except you need to identify that exception and you need to go ahead this is a most commonly asked question only the first two only the first two are true ketone bodies while the third one that is beta hydroxy butyrate does not possess any keto group in it okay so they can ask you the next important point is which of the following is the ketone body without a keto group the answer is beta hydroxy butyrate or 3 hydroxy butyrate it does not have a keto body but it is called as a ketone body okay it does not have any keto group in it so they can ask you which of the following ketone body does not have a keto group the answer is beta hydroxy butyrate so the next important thing is ketone bodies are water soluble they are energy yielding and acetone however is an exception since it cannot be metabolized acetone is a volatile waste product and can be excreted via lungs okay so among the list of ketone bodies the ketone body which is a volatile and an exception to be water soluble and to be energy yielding is acetone we, we know that acetone is a volatile and acetone is is a part of your 
bonding agents okay your bonding agents will contain acetone so that's the reason why it contains a part of acetone and alcohol that's the reason why most of your conservative staff will scold you while you open the open the dentin bonding agent bottle and leave it because volatile substance they evaporate and total dentin bonding agent once the acetone and alcohol are evaporated the dentin bonding agent does not work in the prescribed way so how the utilization of ketone bodies takes place so ketone bodies being water soluble are easily transported from liver to various tissues the two ketone bodies that is acetone and beta hydroxybutyrate serves as an immediate source of energy for the peripheral tissues such as skeletal muscle cardiac muscle renal cortex and the tissues which lacks mitochondria however cannot utilize ketone bodies okay so water soluble ketone bodies are the two we have already discussed they are acetone acetate acetoacetate and beta hydroxybutyrate which are very easy like which things which are water soluble they can move anywhere in the body the production of ketone bodies and their utilization become more significant when glucose is in short supply to the tissues such as starvation and diabetic mellitus during prolonged starvation all these things were already discussed and they are very clearly given in the pdf what i have shared that is more informative during the starvation prolonged starvation ketone bodies are the major source of energy to the brain which is given as a question and many other parts of central nervous system it should be noted that the ability of a brain to utilize the fatty acids for energy is very limited so that's the reason the ketone bodies can meet 50 to 90 percentage of brain energy during the starvation and reactions of the ketone bodies beta hydroxybutyrate is first convert into acetoacetate and it's going to metabolize that acetoacetate is activated by acetyl coa enzyme by the mitochondrial acetyl coa by a mitochondrial enzyme called as thiophorus this is very very important this is an enzyme which is used to convert succinyl coacetate coenzyme transferase and make a note that this particular enzyme is absent in liver then that's the reason why liver cannot utilize ketone bodies liver can synthesize ketone bodies but cannot utilize the same ketone bodies because the absence of thiophorase enzyme this is a most commonly asked question then a few notices about uh, rad that is recommended dietary allowance all the already uh, the total uh, i mean almost all the enzyme all the vitamins have this R rda value so this value varies from textbook to textbook so we made a customized table okay which was posted on the group please go back and just have a look so the customized table is going to give you the right answer in the examination hall so please do that customized table where all the vitamins and their rda values were clearly given and coming to this rda value of niacin is is of main concern the daily requirement of niacin for an adult is around like 15 to 20 mg and for a children it is 10 to 15 mg very often the term niacin equivalents is used for describing the rda value so one equivalent one equivalent of niacin is equal to 1 mg of niacin or is equal to 60 mg of tropofen so 1 is to 60 is the conversion of niacin to tryptophan okay so tryptophan is a precursor i mean niacin is a precursor for the formation of tryptophan and they can ask you the percentage the most commonly asked question the answer is 1 is to 60 okay so uh, tryptophan has many other essential and important functions in the body hence the dietary tryptophan cannot totally replaces the niacin and increased conversion of tryptophan to niacin has been reported in low protein diet and starvation and see the last statement this is very very important the ammonia acid tryptophan can form niacin coenzyme right in the body therefore strictly speaking niacin is not a pro, not a vitamin okay because it is available in the form of tryptophan in the body 
So these are few characteristics of denaturation of protein. So what happens if a protein is denatured? Okay, there are many methods of denaturation of protein. They can be chemical methods, physical methods. Upon application of these chemical and physical methods, the protein will denature. So what happens if a protein is denatured? Okay, so if a protein is denatured, we have already discussed about the primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure and everything. So if a protein is denatured, the native helical structure of the protein is lost. You will lose the helical structure of the protein. But if you come to the primary structure of the protein, which is with the peptide linkages, it remains intact. So the primary structure remains intact, whereas the helical structure of the protein is lost. The biological activity of a protein is lost and denatured proteins become insoluble in solvents okay the denatured proteins are insoluble in the solvents and the viscosity of the denatured protein is also increases whereas the surface tension decreases and i hope you know that the surface tension is inversely proportional to viscosity and the denaturation is associated with increasing in the ionizability of the protein as well as the sulfohydryl groups of the protein this is basically due to the loss of the hydrogen bonds and the disulfide bonds in the protein leading to increasing in the solubility and sulfohydryl groups of the particular protein. So denatured protein is most easily digested by the body. That is the reason why we cook everything. We cook the proteins. So it is due to increasing in the exposure to the peptide bonds to the enzymes. Cooking causes protein denaturation and therefore cooked food or cooked proteins are easily digested and further denaturation of proteins takes place by gastric acid this is reversible okay it's not reverse back for example uh, if you boil an egg or if you make an omelet from an egg means you are denaturing the egg but it cannot be reversed back means you cannot get your boiled egg to turn to normal way or you cannot get your egg back from the omelet okay so that is the denaturation is usually irreversible but there are few exceptions like the careful denaturation is sometimes reversible known as renaturization for example hemoglobin undergoes denaturation in the presence of a poison salicides can be a poison by reversal of salicides there is a chance that the hemoglobin can renature so careful denaturation can cause an effective renaturation. Denatured proteins cannot be crystallized. So these are the 10 points that you have to add for the questions on denaturation of proteins, which is again a most common area of questions. Uh, I'm, I'm done with uh, this particular part and there is one more topic to be discussed and uh, I want a response from your side I think the strength was around like 160 plus sounds very good and I want a response from your side with a word done on the chat box so that I'll proceed further guys I hope you're following good and the voice clarity and the screen clarity everything goes well and organized and I need a proper response from you yes the strength has increased to 180 very good so please do respond me yes yes ravati has responded rishita has responded few more so that i'll proceed further yes shilpa siri bharat kumar vaisnavi pavan oh yeah thank you thank you so much so next one is your questions on nitrogen balance uh, i hope you have seen most of your questions on nitrogen balance so what is this nitrogen balance it's so already discussing nitrogen is a part of your protein nitrogen is a part of your enzyme so nitrogen is one of the most important element in in the body apart from the regular and the most common elements so nitrogen balance can be determined by comparing the intake of nitrogen chiefly by proteins and the excretion of nitrogen from the body so it's just an intake is equal to whatever you are excreting the nitrogen in the urine, whatever you are excreting the nitrogen in the feces, whatever you are excreting the nitrogen in the form of sweat. So by comparing these two things, 
one side the intake and one side the exit you will get the nitrogen whether it is balanced or not for example if if it is positive nitrogen balance positive nitrogen balance is a state in which the nitrogen intake is balanced when the exit of nitrogen is more when compared with the intake the exit is more because the body is not able to use that is negative nitrogen balance it is negative because the body is not able to use the nitrogen and it is exiting or excreting all the amount of nitrogen out so that is the difference between the positive nitrogen balance means body is using more nitrogen negative nitrogen balance body is not able to use the nitrogen so let's make positive so all positive nitrogen balances are the examples because most commonly they will ask in 2018 need they have asked a question like which of the following is a positive nitrogen balance example very simple let's the, take the word positive what is positive and all your examples are positive things see this the positive nitrogen balance is observed in a growing child a child growing the child is growing day by day it's a positive sign a pregnant woman a pregnant woman has to give the nutrition or the nitrogen for the baby also it's a positive sign or during recovery after severe illness you have a fever high fever okay and from the fever you are recovering recovering from a disease is a positive sign so all the positive signs and good things will come under the positive nitrogen balance because the body want more nitrogen to utilize whereas coming to the negative nitrogen balance negative nitrogen balance you can see the examples prolonged negative nitrogen balance may lead to death death is a negative sign all these are protein energy malnutrition syndromes all these are negative things negative things for example even the negative nitrogen balance comes under severe illness recovering from severe illness is a positive sign so positive nitrogen balance but going to a severe illness is a negative sign where a negative nitrogen balance can be seen so examples are more important and just a simple concept behind this example is important i hope you are very clear so what is nitrogen balance a balance between intake and exit so positive is body is using more positive because the intake is more than the exit negative the body is not able to use and excrete everything the excretion is more than intake so positives are seen in the positive signs and negatives are seen in the negative signs very simple done so next this is already discussed uh, in one of the video by sahiti ma'am i'm just going to give a brief idea because this is very very important we have cross 180 strength sounds very good and see this pathway of catecholamine biosynthesis okay so your catecholamine biosynthesis starts from your phenylalanine and ends at the epinephrine the steps that are involved in this the phenylalanine is going to convert into thyroxine the thyroxine is going to convert into l dopa l dopa is going to convert it into dopamine dopamine is going to convert into non epinephrine non epinephrine is going to convert into epinephrine so these are the steps that are involved in the synthesis of catecholamines which starts from phenylalanine to that of epinephrine so they can ask you the enzymes that are involved in conversion of one level to next level okay so they, they can simply ask phenylalanine is converted into thyroxine in the presence of or thyroxine l is converted into l dopa in the presence of or they can simply give an give this this l aromatic amino acid decarboxylase enzyme is going to convert into is going to help in conversion of which of the following whether it's going to be l dopa to dopa or dopa to non epinephrine or non epinephrine to epinephrine so they can ask you multi level question based upon the enzymes that are involved and or based upon the intermediates that are produced in the synthesis of catecholamines so the next goes is again this questions were given uh, far back in your neat exam that is glycemic index
Yes. It's perfect. Uh, yeah, I'm seeing in my mobile, I, I have good clarity in my device. So the glycemic index is, is the comparison. It's a graph comparison. There are variations in increase and the fall of blood glucose levels after taking food or different types of carbohydrates containing food. So means if you take ice cream, so these values, these glucose values will, will be different when compared with the, you take your regular food. Okay, so these qualities differ basing upon that. So basing upon that, there is a time course of the glucose concentration for a particular graph. And taking this graph into consideration, they have determined the glycemic index values. So in specific, what it is called as, it is defined as an area under the blood glucose curve after the ingestion of a food compared with the areas under the blood glucose curve after taking the same amount of carbohydrates as glucose. Very simple. So if you take an ice cream, at the end ice cream will give you some glucose. Right? Yeah, uh, done. We will uh, continue this part. I think there is some issue with the internet. So I'm just ending this topic right now. So we'll continue the discussion in the group. Just I'm left over with the glycemic index, which will be discussed in your respective groups. Thank you. Signing off, Dr. Srikant from Team MDS Conquer. Love you all.